And uh, good morning to those uh, joining us online. Uh, thanks very much for participating, I'm sure from uh, sometimes inconvenient hours of the day and night. Uh, I'm, I'm Nick Benaquista. I'm the Senior Director at the Center for International Media Assistance at the National Endowment for Democracy in Washington, uh, D.C. And uh, it's my pleasure to be the moderator today for the session entitled Advocacy to Action, Engaging Policymakers on Digital Governance. Uh, this session um, is brought to you through a partnership um, between the Center for International Media Assistance, or CEMA, the National Democratic Institute, NDI, and the Center for International Private Enterprise, uh, SIPE. So over the past uh, six years or so, our three organizations have hosted uh, what we call the Open Internet Leaders Fellowship. 41 young leaders have passed through this program, uh, including one of our panelists, uh, who is a, a current uh, fellow. Um, and this program has provided mentorship and networking opportunities uh, for young activists to engage here at the IGF, at RightsCon, uh, globally in multi-stakeholder discussions and dialogues uh, trying to ensure that the internet remains uh, open, interoperable, uh, and accessible. Uh, those uh, fellows work on a range of issues from data privacy, information integrity, digital economy, uh, civic engagement, um, though all of them share uh, an interest in protecting democratic norms and values uh, through their work. Um, so in our small way, this program has tried to fill these multi-stakeholder discussions with young uh, global activists and um, it's, been a, it's been a real pleasure to be a part of this and to get to know um, a, a generation of activists uh, from around the world. So I think one of the big takeaways from the experience of working with these young activists has been that uh, a, a bit of a jarring uh, juxtaposition between the existence of multi-stakeholder dialogue at the global level and the sometimes absence of those multi-stakeholder spaces at the national level. Now, the, the record is mixed, but often I think the um, young leaders find uh, it disappointing to return home and not have the opportunity to engage on these issues. And uh, nowhere, I think, is that absence of multi-stakeholderism more acutely felt than around uh, parliaments, national assembly, and congresses where uh, a raft of uh, legislation around the world is now being developed uh, to govern the internet uh, and the digital sphere. Um, and the legislation, you know, there have been uh, nearly 30 countries, according to Freedom House, that have made some improvements uh, legislatively in the, uh, in the area of internet uh, freedom and governance, uh, but those are still the exception. I think the great majority of laws and regulations coming onto the books are not harmonized with international norms and regulations and are doing some damage to, uh, to freedom. So there's, an, there's a real urgency to engage with parliamentarians. And I think there's a sense that, you know, in some cases, of course, those restrictive laws are done intentionally, but not always. And, and so um, that the engagement with parliamentarians, building uh, knowledge and multi-stakeholder engagement has the real potential uh, to prevent harms from being done and potentially to help uh, improve uh, the openness and freedom on the internet. So this is a realization that I think we all share at the IGF. Uh, the parliamentary stream here is just two years old. And um, we uh, are hoping today uh, we've brought together an excellent panel of, uh, of really talented activists uh, who have some real experience working with parliamentarians. Uh, the Honorable Sarah Pendi, uh, a parliamentarian from uh, Uganda, has, uh, sends her apologies. Uh, she's not been able to, to make it uh, this morning, though there's a slim chance she still might. Um, but the, the three panelists that we have here today um, well, uh, more than enough experience to sort of get us started on the conversation about how to more effectively build multi-stakeholder engagement with parliamentarians. So uh, let me introduce uh, our great panelists. We have uh, to my right, uh, Fernanda Martins, uh, who is the director of uh, Internet Lab. Uh, she's an anthropologist, a PhD student in social sciences at the State University of Campinas. Uh, she's uh, been a researcher on many projects about race, ethnicity, and gender inequalities, and a consultant uh, for international organizations, including uh, UNICEF. Uh, 
To her right is Camilo Arratia Toledo, a digital sociologist at Internet Bolivia and uh, Open Internet for Democracy leader, uh, one of the fellows I was mentioning. He specializes in global digital inclusion, gender, education, development studies. Uh, he's a former research fellow at Gothenburg School of Global Studies, a Global Swede 2021 awardee and a consultant uh, for the World Bank in Bolivia. And to his right is Lisa Garcia, the executive director of the Foundation for Media Alternatives uh, uh, in the Philippines, who specializes in women's rights and ICT. Lisa is also a board member of the Center for Migrant Advocacy, and uh, she may be known to many of you in the IGF community as a former co-moderator of the Dynamic Coalition on Gender. So, uh, welcome guys. Uh, let me um, start uh, at the far right with you, uh, Lisa. Uh, so the, the digital sphere in the Philippines is governed by a number of laws. Um, including uh, the 2012 Cybercrime Prevention Act, uh, the 2012 Data Privacy Act, 2022 SIM Card Registration Act, which uh, was uh, so somewhat controversy. So what, let's start off with the lessons you can share from civil society efforts in your country to ensure that digital rights or rights in the digital realm are respected in the implementation of these laws. How do you protect human rights uh, when legislation is being enacted okay. and implemented. So thanks, Nick. So we, we all have our share, of course, um, in making sure that rights are respected in our own um, respective countries. In the case of our um, organization, what we do is look at digital rights, see how existing laws or proposed um, bills uh, affect or may affect um, our rights as citizens, and from there on, come up with interventions. So if it comes to law, uh, there are um, several uh, layers of intervention where we can um, somehow impact uh, the um, legislation. Um, when, when a bill is being um, deliberated, then um, what we can do is um, actually um, come up with a position paper, participate in um, committee hearings, public hearings being conducted. Um, if, if the law has already been passed, um, then there is still a chance to intervene, and that is with the drafting of the implementing rules and regulations. Um, uh, once it's um, already a law and it's supposed to be implemented, then there is the monitoring of the law for its proper implementation. Um, of course, there are also, aside from the laws being passed, uh, there are also policies emanating from other um, government agencies. Uh, for example, um, in the case of the Philippines, uh, with the, um, they were coming up with the National Cybersecurity Plan. So government would always have this um, uh, consultation with, with different stakeholders. And uh, since, since it's also part of the, the, the issue is also something that we look into, then we make sure that we are invited and that our voice is heard um, when it comes to certain, uh, especially in looking at certain provisions in, in, in these plans. Um, yeah, um, what else? Uh, we, we as a civil society organization, we've been monitoring actually um, and documenting cases of digital rights, especially the violations. Uh, for instance, um, since 2012, we've been um, uh, documenting cases of online gender-based violence in the country. Currently, we are also monitoring developments in the SIM card registration, which you mentioned, which was just passed. There's also the national ID system. We're looking at how um, our rights are affected by the passage of, of these laws. And um, since we've been monitoring them, we have cases, then we have evidence also when, when we go to, when we have dialogues, inter, um, engagements with parliamentarians or, or, or you know, um, policy makers, then we have um, some evidence in our hands that, hey, you know, this is happening. Can we do something about this? So those are some of the things that, um, uh, we do, but at the same time, it's not just with um, legislators, with uh, policymakers that we um, engage with. We also make sure that um, citizens also know their rights, that they are aware of, of um, 
the, the even digital laws that are being passed and how it would impact them. So we also, from time to time, we go to communities and have dialogues with them, conduct workshops, so they know what the laws are and how this may or how these are affecting them um, um, as well. Lisa, th that's, uh, that's terrific. I mean, it sounds like you're really taking advantage of every entry point that exists within the rules and regulations for participation um, in the policy process, as well as, you know, gathering the evidence um, and holding the discussions to keep an eye on how those policies are being implemented, the consequences of those policies. Uh, that sounds like a really holistic um, approach. Now, you hadn't mentioned the agenda setting uh, aspects of policy making. And just a, one quick follow up in terms of who is deciding what pieces of legislation, what issues get legislated uh, and regulated. Um, do you, yeah, any experience on getting civil society to build the agenda, the legislative agenda itself? In our case, um, our focus is really more on, on gender and ICT and then privacy and, and data protection. So we mostly intervene in cases like that. But of course, uh, when it comes to, yeah, so we, we intervene in cases of that. And um, we have also, we also consult with, with our other partners. Um, they may not be um, focused on digital rights per se, but you know, they are working on uh, specific issues that are uh, that may be impacted by this law. So we work with them as well, we consult with them, and we come up with an agenda. For instance, when we were looking at the SIM card registration act, it's been there since, I don't know, 2014, I think, and then by, and we were looking at it already by, by 2018, I think we came up with a briefing paper, my colleagues from the uh, uh, privacy um, program are here. So we came up with a briefing paper already and it was published, it was distributed to um, even um, legislators, uh, to some other groups. And yeah, and yet every Congress, um, uh, there's always someone who um, uh, proposes that bill. It's always there. And, and I, I remember in, in uh, the previous administration, it was about to be passed. Uh, both houses of Congress already um, uh, approved the bill. So it was just for the signature of the president. But what we did in civil society is we, we had a discussion among ourselves. Are we okay with this bill? So what do we do? So, so we came up with a statement. So I think there were three of us. They came up with, they were doing a, an online campaign. One group was doing an online campaign. We, we uh, came up with a statement and we asked other organizations, partner organizations, if they agree with the bill. And if not, there's this statement, maybe you can sign on it. Um, and, and at the last minute, we, we even submitted a letter to the president to veto the said um, um, SIM card registration act. Fortunately, during that time, it was vetoed by the president. We were also surprised by that small win. <laughs> However, of course, things changed. During, um, the next administration, it was the first um, piece of legislation that was passed into law by this current administration. Uh, thanks very much, Lisa. That's great. Though, you know, I'm sure you don't win every battle, but you, uh, you gain strength. Every time you engage in some um, parliamentary debate, I'm sure the networks grow stronger and stronger. So, um, like, that sounds like a terrific uh, approach that you guys are taking. Um, Fernanda uh, from Internet Lab. Um, so, Brazil is known for its experiments in participatory governance, participatory budgeting. In the context of uh, internet governance, um, platform regulation, um, curious to know if uh, you're seeing the same level of innovation in terms of participatory multi-stakeholder uh, policy making. Um, so how are par parliamentarians in your country engaging um, in these issues? And um, are diverse perspectives in particular finding their way into the debates? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Nick, for the invitation and for the question. Uh, it's a really pleasure to be here discussing this same with you. Uh, related to Brazil, to be honest, uh, although Brazil to be known for social participation in discussions and 
related to uh, internet governance. Uh, when we started this new Lula government, I think it is a little uh, frustrated for civil society organization because in comparison with Marco Civil the Internet in 2014, when we had a really uh, participation of academia, civil society organizations, and uh, legislative and executive members, now the context is so different because we had a far-right government in the last four years, and when Lula assumed the new uh, presidential, presidential uh, we had the pressure of society, we have the pressure of federal senate, we have the pressure of chamber of deputies. And with this context, with the uh, sense of an emergence, uh, it's not the same process. So we have the bill 2630 um, discussed in the last three years, and now uh, with the new federal government, we are trying to approve this law. This law is fruit of the civil society organization work in the last three years, uh, combating the uh, Bolsonaro government. So it is a good law with some problems, uh, but uh, we don't have the uh, sure that this law will be approved. So, um, it is interesting to, to think uh, how in Brazil the discussion related to platform regulation uh, gained all society. So, the importance of this discussion now uh, become a kind of bargaining ship with the Congress. So, when far right uh, Congress men uh, decide to vote a thing related to ab abortion, for example, or uh, a, a bill that will attack indigenous people. Uh, the president of the deputy chamber said, no, if you put this in votation, we will vote the 26th third. So it is a movement so complex because we had, in the beginning of the year, the attempt to occupation of Brasilia, and after that, some attacks against public schools in Brazil. And all this discussion is related to all society, not more the experts of uh, digital rights, as in the case of uh, Marco Civil da Internet. So, in this context, I think it's important to say that we don't have a government consulting civil society uh, as occurred in the past. And I think it is a, 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 an important thing to pressure the government. And when we leave this process to uh, uh, left government, we have people from civil society organization in the government, to the government, and uh, it's, it's complex because we know these people, we know that they have good intentions and at the same time we know the complexity of the political conjuncture. So it is a really difficult moment, but a moment which we can uh, hope. So it is hard, but not too hard as in the last four years. Great, thanks. A, thanks a lot, Fernanda. Um, three years. That's a. That's yeah. That's a. That's a lot of work. It sounds like. I mean, can you just um, this one quick follow-on question? The three years that you put into bringing civil society together. Um, can you just say a few words about the the scope and scale of that effort? Does it? Re do you have to travel around the country? Is it a matter of you know meetings in a, you know the capital or a few other cities? How do you how do you do the work of getting um, these diverse views together on on this issue on the twenty six thirty bill? Sure. Uh, so at Internet Lab, we are working with some themes related to internet governance uh, since the, the last nine years. So when this discussion started, we are working together with the Coalizão Direitos na Rede. It is the coalition uh, that have 
uh, more than 50 uh, organizations in Brazil, uh, in all country. And there, we have this movement to try, understand and follow all movements in different aspects of the Congress. And the discussion step by step of these laws, of these bills uh, discussed. And in the case of platforms of regulation, I think uh, it's important to highlight the, the role of the uh, federal deputy, Orlando Silva. He's a congressman uh, in a left party. And in this, um, in, in his role in this discussion, it was so important to have a parliamentar uh, that involved with the discussion. And it's not, uh, it's not common, you know, uh, we have now the discussion related to intelligence, art artificial intelligence regulation in Brazil. And we uh, realized that it's not easy to parliamentarians uh, understand what is, um, what is happening, what is the, uh, the impact of this kind of regulation. And because of that, I think uh, on main problem in this discussion, it is, okay, uh, the government is a uh, portrait of the emergence, but uh, we don't, we can't think just in the emergence. We need to think in the future and in the flexibility of this law, this kind of law need to, to have. So I think the, the point is uh, 10 years after Marco Civil approval, uh, we know that self-regulation has not working. And I don't know, in five years, we might be saying that state regulation was not sufficient. So the challenge uh, for me is how we can uh, learn with what's happened in the last 10 years and not repeat the, the, uh, the wrongs that we committed in, in this process. That, that's, that's terrific, Fernanda. And I mean, it highlights an important point of, um, you know, I, I think engagement for most civil society organizations with parliaments and policy processes tends to start out being quite reactionary. And it sounds like over you know, the last decade, you are beginning to develop the networks and the capacities to think proactively about that agenda, um, which is, yeah, fortunate. I mean, I think that's probably a privileged position relative to others. Um, you also mentioned a, an important point, which is a great segue to this introduction. You mentioned the importance of having an ally in parliament uh, you know, at the beginning of the discussions around uh, the um, misinformation law. Um, and we are, in fact, joined, uh, fortunately, by the Honorable Sarah Opendi, uh, to my left here, who is an executive committee member of the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance, APNIG. So um, she is uh, the you know, executive committee member on a network that is precisely trying to build a network of parliamentarians who can champion these discussions and the development of policy uh, across the African continent. Uh, she is a Ugandan state minister for mineral development, uh, a chairperson uh, at the Uganda Women Parliamentary Association, and prior to all this, uh, the Honorable Appendi was the state minister for health, uh, for which she received a global uh, leadership award. So um, I'm so glad you could join us, um, because it is uh, allies uh, in parliaments willing to work with civil society uh, are uh, too rare indeed. Um, so a question for you, uh, Honorable uh, Appendi. Um, you know, we have seen national policymakers exerting growing influence over uh, the internet and digital governance. Um, you know, policymakers, of course, uh, do represent the public and are held accountable through electoral uh, means. But uh, those forms of accountability are still imperfect uh, in many, in uh, all countries around the world. And it's especially imperfect on an issue such as this, which doesn't have a ton of, pu of public engagement. And so there, there is a risk, I think, you know, that policymakers 
uh, may not be serving the public interest in terms of their engagement on these issues. They might be serving other, other interests, narrow interests, including personal interests. And um, so what, what's your advice and thoughts on how to ensure that policymakers in this area are serving the public interest through their work? And thank you very much, and thank you for that introduction. I bring you all greetings from Uganda, the Pearl of Africa. And uh, thank you for inviting me to this panel. I came in when my colleague was speaking about um, the civil society and how it's important for them to engage with members of parliament. We must agree that as parliament we play a central role between the public, we are between the public and the executive. And our role as members of parliament is certainly to make laws, legislative function, but also the function of representation. And in as much as possible, we must be able to speak and represent the views of the public. But the subject that we are discussing, this digital space, technology, is something that we all knew, know that it's important. However, not much emphasis has been made in even creating awareness among members of parliament on technical matters. So it's very important, since we have the civil society, the NGOs, to first and foremost, as much as possible, give the members of parliament, arm them with the relevant information, the relevant skills, so that they can be able then to represent the public interests better. You have said we are serving personal interests or narrow interests. Yes, true, because even among us as members of parliament, there is a bit of lack of information. Other than us talking about misinformation and disinformation, when it comes to the technical details about internet and internet governance as a whole, we have very few um, people who can speak up on that matter. So this is why we came up with the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance, so that we can bring together like-minded people to champion the issues of internet governance at the country level. Actually, as we speak now, in my country, although we have the ICT, the Internet Communications Technology Committee within Parliament, their role is mainly to oversee you know, oversight over um, the government programs and government policies. But that's not all. We need to engage in advocacy. We need to see the challenges that the population is facing. We need to ensure that internet is affordable. We need to ensure that even as we speak now in my country, only about 29% of the people have access to internet. So we need to ensure that when we are even appropriating funds, we appropriate adequate funds so that the entire country can be covered. We have areas where we don't have electricity as we speak now. Even if, and we have areas where the telecom companies have not been able to invest in. So not the entire country is covered. There are areas you go to and you're off internet. So these are some of the things that legislators must do. Appropriate funds, first of all, recognize the importance of this digital economy and know that it has a multiple economic benefit to the entire population if they are all connected. So we also must ensure that as part of the education curriculum, this whole technology, ICT, is taught to the children because that is also another challenge. We have a population that are a bit illiterate we have people with smartphones and they can't use them. So there is a lot of work that still needs to be done in terms of digital literacy. And of course, engagement of the civil society, engagement of the government are all important. Other than just legislation, there is a lot that we have to do as members of parliament. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, oh. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for, I'm so glad you've been able to join us. Um, and uh, I have some follow-on questions. We're going to come back to you for sure. I, I just want to turn to Camilo for a moment. Um, Camilo uh, joins us from uh, Bolivia, uh, from, the, from Internet Bolivia. Uh, as I said, he's an Open uh, Internet for Democracy fellow. And uh, I think Camilo has a, a really interesting perspective to add. Uh, we've been talking primarily about uh, legislation and policy at the national level, but Camilo has taken a different approach. He's been working at the municipal level, and you don't often think of uh, internet governance uh, and digital governance at the municipal level, but um, you have a, a, a strong view on this. So can you explain um, why the municipality is a good place to engage in Bolivia? And I think it's on data privacy in particular, uh, the issue that you're working on. So if you could say a few words about your approach. Thanks. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, yes, uh, actually, I, I've been working with Internet Bolivia Foundation, and I think that Bolivia Internet Foundation is working uh, really well in uh, municipality level, local levels, uh, because as you know, there is no actually a regulation for protection and processing of personal data in Bolivia, but it doesn't mean that we have to be unprotected and we, we, we shouldn't be policies about that uh, in, in local levels, right? Uh, we have like a really good news, and uh, I think uh, we have, for, ex for instance, in Coroico, like it's a small municipality in Bolivia, recently they, 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 they have a policy about digitalization and data management, for example. And that, made me, that, that makes me think that how you can really work in, la, in local levels, right? And then I, I decide to, to focus on uh, why, and I think I have some uh, reasonable reasons. <laughs> I think that uh, uh, working in the, in the municipality level, in local levels, uh, have a, a very direct and deeply understanding uh, how the, what are the local needs, for example, in the communities. Uh, because they are really close to the people, they can work with them. Uh, and in these terms, after the pandemics and after uh, everything we throw the last years, I think that the digital access, the data protection, the internet usage, the digital violence, the gender approach, uh, having a very very important things, right? And in the local levels, you can also work with them. Uh, another thing is like maybe in some local uh, regulations, they can be more faster and more effective because sometimes in the local, uh, from a national perspective, for example, there is a lot of bury bureaucracy. You have to like uh, many steps to do it, but sometimes in local levels, you can do like more effective and faster approach, and they are less bur bureaucratic. Uh, in the, and, and in that sense, like the, the local policy can be even better than the, than the national level, right? Uh, and, and sometimes I think that would be really easy uh, for a local level to ensure really nice policies in, in that sense. Uh, uh, also, I think that uh, I have another reason that is about like innovation and digital. Uh, in, in this topic, at least, I think that it provides like to be like a pilot. I don't know, because for example, as I mentioned in Coroico, they recently have this uh, digitalization and data management uh, regulation. And after it happened, like many other municipalities wants the same. They contact Internet Bolivia, and they want to know what is this about, what they have it, uh, so is it possible to have in a local level? We don't have to wait for the national level. So I think that's a really nice entry point, because now they are interested, and they realize they can actually do some policy in digital uh, uh, rights uh, in, uh, in, from local perspective, and it's possible, right? Uh, and also, I think uh, I was thinking about uh, how uh, have this local uh, digital rights regulations can empower actually some uh, local leaders also because sometimes the local leaders uh, are, are young usually because in the national uh, uh, in the, nas the national policymakers usually are not that young as the local national as the local uh, policymakers so these local policymakers if they are young and they are engaged in these digital topics actually they are very uh, empowering about these topics so i think that's very interesting and taking again the example of Coroico, I think that she's uh, the, like the major is like a woman and she's 30 years old, so she's really young and she's really into these digital topics. And I think it was a really nice way to empower her to know about this topic and to talk about that and to, and to be like a, a, a really nice uh, policy now. And also I think that it's really, I think the most important thing can be like the community involvement. 
because uh, I, I used to I used to criticize a lot some uh, local governments because sometimes uh, the like the local representatives in the national policy making uh, uh, assemblies, for instance, they usually don't live in the communities anymore. They just decide to move to the big cities and make local policies for them, but from big cities, and they don't live in their local cities anymore. Like for example, if I am uh, like a policy maker in. In La Paz, for example, from a small town, but they decide to move to the big city in La Paz, but they are not more engaged in the local municipality. Uh, and, and, and I think that doesn't work. That's why they don't really do like, good policies in that term. But when you work in a municipality level from local perspective, that people is living there, they are with them every day, they can realize what, what, what they can do. And in that terms, I think that's very interesting to work from a municipality entry level point. Uh, that's great, Camilo. And uh, I'm, I'm going to go back to the Honorable uh, Ms. Appendi in a moment uh, to react to some of what you've said. But uh, a quick follow-on question for you. Um, it seems to me that you've probably learned a lot about how, uh, what makes people care about digital policy issues. Um, why, you know, when, with so many pressing issues in a local community, why, what convinces people that data privacy, of all things, is something important? Uh, yeah, I think it's a nice because when when we are, were working with Internet Bolivia in these local communities, we usually like to do like some workshops and everything. And I think that is very important because if the people from the communities know about what we are going to do, I think that is a really nice entry point to make them uh, like this kind of policies about digital governance. Because sometimes people from like small communities, they thought this, this is a really huge and big issue. But sometimes when you talk, when you teach them and when they are engaged and we do workshops and we try to show them how it should improve, I think they are more engaged. And I really like, for example, uh, some communities we are working for and we are, uh, I used to travel also around uh, inside Bolivia since I work uh, for Internet Bolivia. And for example, in Villa Montes, there is a really nice community and you can work with them these topics. Just uh, as soon as we arrive to Villa Montes, they know we are like Internet Bolivia Foundation and they just approach you and like, we want some workshops, we want to know something about digital rights. And they are into this. So it's really nice, actually, because we are not imposing. They are asking to us to, to engage in these topics. And, and after just working with, this, with the communities, then the policymakers come, the government come and say, oh, what should we do because people is interested. Uh, and I think that is, that is really interesting. And also, I, and I think it's very important also that we have, for example, in Internet Bolivia, we have like a nice organization a partner. Uh, and she works in Coroico, for example, or in Villamontes, like all the time, and they are present there. We are not just, I think that's very important to not to be an NGO that just come there for a two or three focus group, for example. And then the policymakers know, and the people from the community know that this is just some guy or some organization that comes for like one week, two, three days just to do some observation work. Now they realize what we need. And I think that's not a good entry point. But if you work continuously every week, or basically you live in the community, or, or you just work in different other topics, they usually engage with the topics we want. Uh, and that happened, I think, in Coroico, because in Coroico, I realized that people is really eager to these topics about digital, bi digital violence, for example, because we are we're constantly traveling there. And we, we also help them with other kind of topics, like youth uh, empowerment, for example. And it's really interesting. And also now in Villamontes and in Coroico in Bolivia, there are these small communities, but they are also working for regulation uh, for youth, for example. But they are, pu they, they, they are putting in these youth uh, policies like the digital perspective, because they are young and we are living in a digital era. So now it's like the digital perspective is gonna be in this regulation yeah. policy. So it doesn't have to be also like digital regulation. It can be like the young regulation, Jot and Part 1 regulation, but with a digital perspective. Great, thanks a lot, Camilo. Um, I, I just have one last question uh, for you, Honorable Appendi, and then um, I'm gonna open up the floor for your questions. Um, so those of us who, who are sitting behind, please come join the table. Uh, it's a workshop, so we do at least where we can see you in case you have a question. Uh, and there's, yeah, there's plenty of chairs over here. So um, we've heard from the other panelists, you know, different approaches to engaging with uh, policymakers uh, in the Philippines, taking advantage of the 
kind of formal structures of participation that um, that the, the National Assembly there uh, offers for participation, uh, this municipal level engagement that uh, Camilo was describing. And in the case of Brazil, really um, building on, uh, building a, a strong network of civil society organizations in conjunction with allies in the, in the parliament and in the government over the course of many years to actually be proactively put forward ideas for, for, for policy. Um, I think a lot of the folks here are probably asking themselves, where do I, what is the best strategy? And I mean, I know it, it's contextual and it will, it will vary, but what advice do you have for folks on how to think about um, how to start engaging with policymakers. Bottom up, start here in, in this space and bring more parliamentarians, build the networks. I mean, there's many options, but what, what, what do you think works? In my view, the way we are structured in my country, in Uganda, is that we have a national parliament. Members of parliament are elected from the grassroots but also at local government level, we have um, elected leaders at the district level and the sub-county level. But also aware that we, connectivity is still low and access to internet a little limited, as I said, only 29% of the population currently um, have full access to internet. The best way is to engage members of parliament. It should be a top, bottom approach. And why I'm saying that is because when you move to the local government level, while at the national level we have the ICT committee that does oversight over issues of internet, when you get down to the local government level, that kind of committee is missing. And therefore, it is the members of parliament who should be the link to the lower local governments. And that's why I'm opting for the top, bottom approach. But also, as I did indicate, awareness creation amongst the members of parliament is key. But also, arming the members of parliament with the key information is also very important. We are now talking here about issues of artificial intelligence, about other than a few members of parliament reading about it. I'm not sure that we are even one third that know the details about the challenges and the benefits of artificial intelligence. So it's important for the civil society organizations, aware that they are also grassroots best and they pick views from the grassroots, it's important that they pick this information, whatever information they have, and all those other uh, technical information, and bring it to the members of parliament, and then we can be able to champion this. But also the other thing is to ensure that at the parliamentary level, actually, as we speak now, I am trying to create a um, parliamentary network on internet governance, a forum, a parliamentary forum on internet governance, so that we can have this away from the ICT committee, we need to have members of parliament who can be champions on issues of internet governance. So this to me is the way to go because then when you have this forum, which is not the official parliamentary forum, then we can be able to handle issues of advocacy and deal freely with the civil society organization. So that is to me the way to go. Thank you very much. That's great. That that forum, a little bit separated from the uh, kind of official policy-making bodies, gives more freedom to engage. Yes, that yes, it's, it's away from the usual committees because yeah. their work is structured yeah. in a certain way. Yeah. Uh, that's a terrific piece of advice, great. Uh, I'd like to open up the floor. Uh, questions, also experiences. If you uh, have uh, uh, some lessons learned um, down at the end, uh, is there, uh, am I, oh, Herman, is there a microphone in front of you there? Um, I think the camera, they probably prefer that you grab a microphone and be at the okay. table. Well, thank you, thank you very much. This is uh, Herman Lopez from the board of the Judge Standing Group of the Internet Society. It, thank you very much for, for your explanations. It's really good to see different perspectives from the global south on how to 
coordinate between a more local level and a more national level. But I, I wanted to ask the, the panelists, the speakers, maybe what uh, like practical advice should we take when we do that coordination? I particularly work in many uh, advocacy issues with the Colombian Congress, but it's usually very difficult to translate those discussions that are happening in the capital city, in Bogotá, to other places. So I would like to know in your own experience how you're able to, to better do that because sometimes what happens is that issues get, like, get lost in translation. When they're coming from the local level to the national level, sometimes issues tend up changing a lot, but also the other way around, when not, where the government from the national level is trying to do things in the local level, it also changes. So, so how can, what can we do to kind of preserve the message and preserve the idea that was originally intended? So thank you very much. Great. I'll take a, yeah, another couple of questions. Yeah, go ahead, Tabakile, and then Claire. Thank you so much um, for the reflections there. Um, I will come in and just share an experience from our end. My name is Tobegila Matimbe and I work for Paradigm Initiative. Um, we work across Africa promoting digital rights and digital inclusion. And um, a few years back, what we did as Paradigm Initiative is we um, came up with a draft uh, digital rights bill, which we uh, introduced uh, within um, the Nigerian parliament. And we were able to collaborate with some parliamentarians um, who were able to help us push forward that digital rights bill. Um, but unfortunately, after it had sailed through, um, you know, uh, with parliament, um, it then was not um, assented to by the president. So I'm just curious in terms of how we can collaborate in terms of um, effective, not, I don't want to use the word lobbying, but effective, uh, you know, pushing for um, in laws to be, to be enacted and how um, that process works. I will also just possibly direct this question to the honorable minister, um, honorable member of parliament from, from Uganda in terms of um, what the recommendation would be with regards to how we can effectively see the enactment of digital rights um, enabling uh, legislation in view of that. And also in other jurisdictions that we work in, we've noted that as well, we have a challenge where um, we might engage with members of parliament, but then uh, what happens is that when a political party has a certain view on something, no matter how much you engage with a member of parliament, the outcome of that possible engagement and collaboration with a member of parliament might be futile because at the end of the day, even if you sort of like in principle agree on what needs to happen uh, with regards to policy, the pushback comes from the political parties that uh, members of parliament, parliament um, come from. So what would be the, the way forward in that respect? Thanks. Claire, go ahead and introduce yourself first, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Claire Mohindo from Uganda, and um, it's good to hear from the Honorable Minister from Motherland. Um, supplementary to what she mentioned about parliamentary forums, and I'm really glad she's mentioned that they are planning to set up a parliamentary forum, because from experience on advocacy and different issues, Parliamentary forums have been um, very key in educating members of parliament on key issues, especially, but also to help uh, build a group of champions on key issues. So it's a good thing to hear that um, they're planning to come up with a parliamentary forum on internet governance. I'm curious to know how far that has gone, at what stage have you reached in terms of setting up that forum. Um, also to pick on lessons from um, my engagement with um, the Uganda Media Sector Working Group, which is a coalition of uh, stakeholders from the media industry, academia, um, government, the media council, and uh, the ministry of ICT. Uh, what we've been doing is to um, organize sessions where we educate people on different laws that have been passed, even those that we don't agree with. But to uh, sort of like create awareness, create messages and break down things to help people understand them. So it would be nice to know how far the parliamentary forum uh, setting up process has gone so that we can see how to 
collaborate and see how to work with the members of parliament. Great. Thanks, Claire. Thank I'm going to go back to the panelists now because otherwise we're going to run out of time. So there's Herman's question about the mismatch between the local and the national level. Uh, from Nigeria, what happens, uh, how do you do effective lobbying? There's a bit of a swing and a miss there. And what happens when it gets politicized, when you end up with real strong political opposition from one side to your proposal? And Claire, how is this uh, parliamentary committee, um, uh, sorry, this, this parliamentary forum, I should say, uh, developing? So. Um, I, I know many, uh, Ms. yeah, do you want to start uh, with the responses there? And then you guys as well, please. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Maybe I'll begin with the parliamentary forum. Um, we are, we've uh, written to the speaker and we're still waiting for a response because certainly uh, the speaker must agree to either being a patron or not. So. Um, that's where we are, otherwise we have membership uh, drawn from um, uh, different political parties. So we'll certainly let you know once we are done with that. And of course, this has all arisen because of the various um, engagements or meetings that I have attended. And I'm busy out here while in country, within parliament, there is not much work that is being done. So it is actually something that I have championed as myself. Aware that um, it's quite important to have that advocacy arm. And of course, moving to my sister, she was talking about uh, the challenges of the politics around some of these uh, bills that come in parliament in relation to internet or digital uh, the digital bills. But I want to just tell you that once you have champions, irrespective of which political party they belong to, they will stick to what they believe is right and what should be done. And that's why it's important during this whole process, when you have a bill before parliament, you need to identify champions. And if a bill has moved through the processes and the president has not assented, when you have people in parliament convinced that that bill is important, they will still stick to that. In my country, we've, have be, we've had bills that have gone to the president, and the president has not assented to them and returned them. And the law says when you re the president returns, and parliament returns it to the president, and the president returns it again, and parliament returns for the second time, it becomes law. For as long as we do not change our position, so the most important thing first is to convince members of parliament that the provisions in that bill are correct. And once, but also the population, because it's the population that puts pressure also on members of parliament. So when they hear all these voices from the population urging their members of parliament to stick to certain provisions or to stick to this law and they want that law, definitely the members of parliament will act. So do not just engage the members of parliament. As civil society, also engage the population so that the voices can come from down and put pressure on members of parliament. And then they'll be able to move. Irrespective of the president's position, irrespective of the political party's position, the members will stick to that bill that they believe is the correct one and has majority support from the population. So that is just my advice. Do not lose hope. If the bill was returned, engage members of parliament, go and engage the population to put pressure on their members of parliament. I think the other was from um, the gentleman who was asking how we can move from the national to the local level. One of the ways is once you have uh, members of parliament armed with the necessary information and you have the members of parliament, like the forum I'm talking about, then you can engage the population through radios. We have radio talk shows, for example, as the Uganda Women's Parliamentary Association, we have certain bills that we are working on, like the marriage bill in my country. It's over 100 years, 1905. So what we do is to go out. You may not reach every community, but when you get to the different radio stations in different regions, you reach out to a wider audience sensitize them so that they can understand, but also they can call in 
and you get the views from them. The other is to engage, for example, we have local governments in my, in, in my country, at the district level and at the sub-county level. You can engage those local government leaders, equip them with the relevant information so that they can also reach down and speak to the population. That, so that, those are some of the things that can be done. Thank you very th much. Thanks very much. Um, so we're running short on time. Um, I just wanted to give you guys each a couple of minutes to respond to the three questions. Uh, Lisa, do you want to do you want to start? Uh, we're not going to be. I think, unfortunately, time won't allow for another question. But stick around. I'm sure there'll be an opportunity for us to chat informally too. Yeah. Okay. Um, that disconnect between um, the community and the, at the national level. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's not just engagement with um, legislators that we do. Um, engagement with the community is also important, and that's uh, one of the things that we do. With we have hold discussions with um, groups uh, within the community, and also um, um, I agree actually with with um, the honourable opinion that, that engagement with the local government um, works because in our case, for instance, if there are certain laws that are difficult to pass, um, it would take years, years, even decades for some laws to be passed. But if you engage with the local government, they can pass policies, for instance, this policy on uh, anti-discrimination. Some, some, some um, um, cities have passed this. Uh, and yeah, it did not have to pass through national legislation. Uh, there's also the role of social media. Of course, we, we need to engage um, individuals uh, wherever, in whichever platform they are. So it's important to engage them in, in that area, provide them with information about um, digital rights issues. Um, and then we also do some, we, we do partnerships with different groups. Um, in, uh, for instance, in the case of, we're, we're doing some campaign on this information for people to understand what it is all about. So we partnered actually <coughs> with artists, with comic artists. We, uh, they came up with, with um, a series of comics explaining what, what this information is all about and then why it's bad for you, etc. And not just that we published it on social media, we also hold exhibits in different areas for people to understand what it is all about. Because sometimes, you know, people, it, it's difficult if we just give them, if you have this long researches that you have people want to read that. So the visual thing, and if it's short, then that's something that, that they would um, read. And also engagement with the media. If you want to hype your issue, then go to the media. So there's also a, a wider reach uh, to the public. Great. Camilo? Uh, OK, yeah, I know we don't have so much time. So I would just would like to say that I truly believe in the community level working. And as uh, I would like just to highlight what uh, honorable uh, minister says, uh, like uh, I think we should have like key champions in some issues, but also I need I think we should have like municipality or local uh, communities champions in some special topics, and that can be a really nice uh, way to work and show other local communities how uh, some nice regulations could be done. Final word to Fernanda. Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, really good questions. I think one of the challenges that we have is to connect international, national, and local levels. So at Internet Lab in the last year, because of the elections, we had the opportunity to have part of uh, articulation room against disinformation. And I think it was really important because in this articulation, we don't have only digital rights uh, organizations, but also different ONGs related to um, uh, human rights in general in the country. And considering the, the size of Brazil, we know that it's not enough that people in Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro are talking about digital rights and the process to uh, approve laws and regulate platforms. So when we uh, work together with CSOs of different fields in the country and different fields in the global south, I think we have the opportunity to pushing for laws, but not only uh, pushing to uh, pressure the big techs, pressure the different companies that are um, affecting our uh, way of life. So 
One example to finalize is the uh, law that we have in Brazil against political gender-based violence. And we are using all the structures that the state gives us. And so, for example, we have a mean reform each year, in, uh, not each year, after the election, we have a mean reform and the election a mean reform. And we are trying to approve in this mean reform some points related to this law that is connected also to uh, hate speech online against women. So we are trying all the time to occupy the structures that exist and create new structures. And I think it's not possible if, you, if we don't uh, work together uh, with different uh, stakeholders. So thank you, Nick. Th thank you, guys. Um, look, thanks very much to our panelists today. I have to say, uh, I've, this is my first IGF, and uh, you know I'm a little biased, but I feel like this panel has given me a little bit of hope. There's a lot of really amazing work. It's really substantive, it's very specific, there's real results here. And um, for my colleagues at SAI, SEMA, uh, NDI, uh, obviously be, you can be in touch directly with the panelists up here, but is there some way to kind of stay in touch with this conversation about parliamentary engagement? How should people, what's, where, what should they be looking out for, I suppose? Any final recommendations from our colleagues on how to stay in touch? Hello, this is Daniel O'Malley from the Center for International Media Assistance. And yeah, I think this is a really great panel. I learned a lot um, listening. And um, I think if people are interested in, in this type of engagement with parliamentarians and, and, and policymakers at the national, international, and local level, just reach out to me or come talk to Anna because this is a topic that we're quite interested in because we think that it is an opportunity to promote digital rights in this broader context where we know that, that uh, internet freedom is slipping and so we need to, to work on all lov levers of, um, of uh, government and to, to, as Fernando was saying, you know, use the mechanisms we have and create new mechanisms. So yeah, I would say just reach out to us and stay in touch. And um, thank you everyone for showing up at 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> Indeed, and uh, to those online, thanks for joining as well. We had a pretty good uh, uh, number of participants. So look, round of applause for our panelists and for yourselves. Thanks very much, everybody.